All right. Hey, everybody. I'm coming from uh, the ocean view behind me. So hope you don't have envy over me. I'm enjoying my stay here on the water. In the meantime, I was thinking of you, and I would like to put a video together today to teach you a little bit about the HVAC system and how the TXV comes together with it. So if you bear with me, I'm going to bring up a presentation here, and I want to give a shout out to somebody who put this all together. Uh, this presentation that I'm going to show a portion of it to you is from uh, Dick Wirtz, and this is Refrigeration Training Services, and uh, him and his wife do a phenomenal job. I really appreciate the work, and I use their presentations a lot to uh, show about heat and air. So Dick and Irene Wirtz, thank you very much for this presentation. And with that, let's get started. So I'm going to change this presenter display right here. And I've got another screen over here y'all can't see. And I'm going to get to the important part here that I want to show you. So just to give a little, uh, a few little tips here on installation. You see this is a condensing unit right here. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to have some distance between the unit and the wall. A lot of people don't even think about this, and it becomes a serious problem uh, for the service guy. You know, some of the guys that install it, they're not thinking about service. They just put it in. It looks good, and they leave. But we got to have a, a minimum of two feet. And I know there's a lot of them they are less than that, but a minimum of two feet so that a guy can get behind the unit, take the panel off, and work on it, okay? So we got to have that. Another thing, too, is we need good airflow. And I've been to job site visits, uh, you know, in the last, you know, 34 years of my experience and 15 years as a tech rep. And a lot of times I would find walls wrapped around these units, uh, bushes wrapped around these units, trying to hide them. And I understand that the homeowner doesn't, Sometimes I want these things to be seen or uh, I've worked for property owners that these units can't be seen or else they'll be stolen. All right, I get it. But you got to have room for this unit to breathe as an air-cooled unit. So be sure that you have a, a good distance and every manufacturer has a minimum clearance for a reason and be sure to follow that. And also, if you got a heat pump unit during defrost, you know, the, these things freeze up in the winter. And when they thaw out, the water's got to drain away. And if a heat pump is sitting flat on a pad, um, it's got its own little feet built into it, but it's not a whole lot. Um, so some people put these on little uh, little risers. And especially if you're up in the north and you got a snowfall, you definitely want these risers on there. Down in the south where I'm at, um, you, you can put it on the pad, but make sure the pad is above ground. And if you go to a unit, you get a new customer or you got a customer you've been servicing for years and eventually that pad just kind of, you know, washes down into the ground. Um, you got to get that unit back up. And I've actually taken units and they got enough little flexibility in the copper line set and lifted them up and slid a new unit, a new pad underneath that unit because a heat pump has to drain. And if you don't get in there and clean out the bottom of that heat pump, if all you do is wash the coils and, hey, I know this unit very well. Um, and thankfully, this is the newer model that's got quarter-inch screws, uh, quarter-inch uh, sheet metal screws. Before, you used to have Phillips heads, and that was a pain in the butt to get those things out. But now, at least they got quarter-inch, uh, you know, quarter-inch head screws in there. Get all those out. But you got to take that grill off. You got to clean that coil. You got to take that fan off. And you got to pick the fan up and get in there and get the worm dirt out of there. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a growth in there. You know, I understand that a lot of dirt packs in there, but you got to get it out. If not, every time that heat pump thaws out in the winter, all the water falls in the bottom. And if it doesn't go anywhere, guess what? It starts rebuilding itself back up on the heat pump. And you'll go out there and you'll think there's a defrost problem. You'll change a board. You'll change sensors. You're going to pull your hair out, but the reality is, is the water can't go nowhere, 
so it refreezes. And I'll give you a tip. If you go to a heat pump and it's got frost on it, then it's a defrost issue. And, and also, by the way, the, the rule is if the frost is coming out past the grill guard, then you got a problem. Frost is going to accumulate. No problem there. And the, the, you know, the defrost system should get rid of it. But if it's getting past the grill guard and it's not going away, okay, now you got a defrost problem. But look at the frost on there. If it's flaky frost, okay, no problem. But if it's hard ice, that hard, you know what I mean? That hard ice like it's in your ice maker, that's water, standing water that is now freezing on the coil. That's a good indication that we don't have proper drainage on that heat pump and it's now building back up and the water is refreezing. You'll chase your tail and the only problem is the ice needs to be melted, the heat pump needs to be cleaned out and it needs to be lifted up above the ground so that it can properly drain. Next, let's take a look at this. All right, the indoor unit. A couple of things we got to look at. One, Please run the refrigerant line so they don't block access to the unit. They don't cover up the blower door uh, so that, you know, we can get in there and take the door off and work on the darn thing. Don't run the refrigerant lines right in front of the unit. See how this is nice and curved on the side. And also you need to have a proper trap. Now, this picture shows a PVC drain line and it's got a little run trap here. I'm going to tell you right now, this is not deep enough. I'm going to do a whole new segment on drain traps. You would be amazed at the problem drain traps can cause when they're not properly sized. I've gone to job sites. I got a homeowner. I got the builder. I got the technician, the company owner, and a lawyer because we got the big M word inside the unit, right? The black stuff. And it's all because... We didn't have the proper trap. So I'll talk about these traps later, but they're critical, huge in the South anyway. Now, if you're in a dry climate, no big deal, but anywhere you've got humid summer, drain traps are huge. And I'm going to tell you right now, this picture is of the typical drain trap. It's too shallow. I promise. And also they're talking about sealing the duct work. That's a whole nother segment we'll talk about later. Now, a rooftop unit. Okay, so now I'm talking to the light commercial folks out there. These rooftop units, when they sit on these curbs, it's real important that the <laughs> that the uh, you know the gasket gets installed before you put the unit on the curb. A lot of units are installed and they get leaks in them, and it's because there's no gasket on the curb. How do you fix it? Take it back up, put a gasket on the curb. Very, very important, super critical. Now, if you want to know, if you get leaks on this unit, okay, um, the best way to do it is to have somebody go up underneath the unit where the ductwork is and then have somebody on the roof and you just pour, get a hose and pour water over the top of this unit. Don't try to spray it underneath because that ain't rain. Just pour it all over the top of it. A lot of times you can see where the leaks are, and it could be the gasket, you know, got kinked, got pulled up. Who knows? Maybe it's dry rotted by now. And maybe you can get up inside the unit there and uh, seal it back up. So hopefully you don't got to pull it all off the curb. But please, please, please put the gasket on the curb. Uh, so there you go. Now, the economizer, check it out. And I know what happens to economizers. Nobody pays attention to them or they get screwed shut or maybe they get screwed open. But make sure that they are working and they are in the right position. There are tablets on these to know where to put the little lever in there, the, the damper, and you can measure to see if you're in the right spot. Understand this is just raw air. There's no control. We don't have any way of knowing what the condition of the air is coming in. Nothing you can do about that. All you can do is make sure you got fresh air coming in because it dilutes the air in the building so we don't have people, you know, getting sick and headaches and 
from uh, too much carbon monoxide in the space. Get a carbon monoxide uh, alarm, and then it'll tell you if you're getting too much in there. Next. Now, condensate drains. They do provide a liquid seal to the air handle. In other words, when the water gets in that trap, it now creates a, a seal for the vacuum side of it. I'm going to go to a lot more in-depth on these drain traps than what we're about to see here. But let's talk about it. So we got a, a when you're in a pull-through coil, in other words, the blower is on the outlet side of the evaporative coil, then you're going to have a negative draw on the drain trap. And if it's not deep enough, that blower will suck the water out of that trap. If you've ever had a unit and it's running, 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 and when it shuts off, all the water gushes out of the drain trap, <laughs> that means the trap's too shallow and or your static pressure is too high on the return side. And that's another topic we'll talk about later. All right, so let's go through here. Let's look at these pictures real quick because this is important. Okay, you see this trap, and I know this is a picture of an easy trap. And they did a great job. But if you look in all of your installation manuals, it'll give you the dimensions on how to build a drain trap. It's extremely important that at least this side right here is a minimum of four inches deep, but it's also got to be two inches up on the other side. Four and two, okay? That other trap we saw in that other picture, was too shallow. It's like a three quarter inch drain trap. It's terrible. It's okay for a positive drain coil. In other words, an evaporator coil on the outlet of a furnace, but not for a negative drain. If you got an evaporator coil on the return side of the blower, you have got to have a trap that it's at least four inches deep and then goes back up two inches, okay? If not, I promise you, it's not going to drain properly. I'm going to make a video of it. I'm going to use this tubing and I'll show you. But trust me, if you build a trap, if you build it on your own with PVC pipe, it's got to be a four inch straight piece and a two inch straight piece. And then when you stick in the elbows and everything, you'll be fine. Or use an easy trap and it's already set up for you. No problem. And last but not least, before I in this video for now when you're doing refrigerant piping when you cut it don't forget don't turn the cutter in the same place every time cut it and when you as you turn the tubing cutter around the pipe turn that wheel a little snug in different places because if not you're going to create a huge dent in one part of that pipe and yes it can cause a restriction especially in the 3 8 liquid line, okay? So be sure that you just, you cut it evenly all the way around. And when you take it loose, please ream out the, the you know, you got burrs inside there. And when you ream it, turn the tubing upside down so the burrs fall out, not in, okay? Um, be sure you use, uh, you know, your nitrogen when you braise. We'll talk all about that later. If you don't, all the black stuff on the outside is also on the inside. Number one failure for expansion valves is debris. Uh, number one, manufacturers take these things apart all the time. They don't like spending money on warranty. And I promise you, they study every single piece that comes in. I've been a part of that group. I've in interacted with that group as a carrier and trained tech rep for 15 years. And they'll tear these expansion valves apart. And yes, there are problems, there are factory issues, we've all dealt with that, but the number one failure for expansion valves is debris. And a lot of times due to not running nitrogen through the system, you gotta do it. You already got it on your truck, just hook it up, turn it on just a little bit. I mean, turn that nitrogen on so very small that you can barely feel it on your lips, barely hear it in the ears. And if your regulator doesn't hold it, then get that other regulator that's got a, a purge feature on it. They're great, preset, ready to go. Once you do that, then you're gonna uh, 
you know, vacuum it down, 500 microns, charge it up. Whole nother class, but just want to cover that in these little basic piping practices. Okay, now, I'm going to let that go for now. And let me close this. And I just want to say, listen, before I go, I'm going to do a whole series, okay, of installation practices, service practices. And I want to go over the four basic components, the compressor, the meter and device, the evaporator coil, and the condenser coil. And there are a whole, and there's a whole lot to cover in there. And we're going to throw in that. So we got the evaporator coil, the condenser, the meter device, and the compressor. And I'll break this up into mini series and hit the highlights. If you want more detailed, in-depth training, let me know. I'll schedule it. And you can get Nate certified or get Nate credit hours for it. Have a great day. And visit my website at jojohvac.com. That's J-O-E-J-O-E-H-V-A-C.com. And also from there, click on the bottom and go to my YouTube channel and see what else I got. Subscribe, like, hit notification. Thanks a lot. Have a good night.